we're going to be discussing the scapula. What I'm showing you right now is an anterior view of the scapula. scapula. You can see that it's rather nondescript in terms of the majority of the body of the scapula in the anterior view. You'll also have this projection right here, which is referred to as the coracoid process. We'll talk more about the coracoid process in a moment. Whereas if you look at a posterior view of the scapula, you can see this very prominent scapular spine here, which is going to end in the acromion. You can actually palpate the acromion and spine when you pat yourself on the back. One other thing I want to show before I move on to the other features is a lateral view of the scapula. You can see the two main processes, your acromion and your coracoid. So coracoid is going to be the more anterior, acromion will be the more posterior. And then you have this very prominent glenoid cavity. The glenoid cavity is what's going to articulate with the head of the humerus forming the glenohumeral joint, which is your true shoulder joint. One thing I want you to note about the glenoid cavity is how shallow it is, and particularly when we talk about the acetabulum of the, um, of the pelvis, you'll see that that's quite a bit deeper. So the shallowness of this cavity actually has lots of implications in terms of the mobility of the shoulder joint as well as the stability of the shoulder joint. Okay, now looking back at an anterior view of the scapula, we're going to talk about the two main angles. You're going to have the superior angle, which is going to be a site of insertion of the levator scapulae, and then the inferior angle, which is sometimes an origin site for the latissimus dorsi. There are two main borders associated with the scapula. You're going to have the medial border and the lateral border. And sometimes when I'm getting confused as to which one's medial or lateral, I think about where the glenoid cavity is. You know, the glenoid cavity has to be lateral because it's articulating with the humerus, so this has to be the lateral border, whereas this is the medial. Looking at a posterior view and still discussing the borders, the medial border is going to be an insertion site for your rhomboid muscles that we talked about earlier in the semester. Rhomboid major is going to be inferior to your scapular spine, and rhomboid minor is going to attach at the root of the spine. Now, looking at the lateral border, so remember, associated with that glenoid cavity, your lateral border is going to be much thicker than the counterpart on the medial side. This is because it's going to prevent buckling due to all the stress in this region, so a much stronger portion of the bone right here. Teres major and teres minor will have attachment sites here. Now looking back at the coracoid process, so projecting anteriorly from this lateral end of the bone, this is an area of quite a few muscle attachments. Your short head of the biceps brachii is going to originate here, as well as coracobrachialis, and pectoralis minor is going to insert on the coracoid process. It's also an important attachment site for ligaments that are associated with the shoulder joint and acromioclavicular joint. Your coracoacromial and coracoclavicular ligaments will attach here. So very important in terms of the anatomy of the shoulder joint. Okay. Now we're looking at a posterior view now. We already mentioned the spine, but it's this heavy ridge that's going to extend all the way to the acromion here. Important in terms of supporting the acromion process and dividing the scapula. It's also an insertion site of your large trapezius muscle. The acromion is going to be laterally projecting. Oftentimes you'll hear this referred to as the point of the shoulder. 
This is going to articulate with the clavicle, clavicle at the acromioclavicular joint. So very important in terms of shoulder separation. Okay, so the spine is going to divide the body into two main fossa. You're going to have your supraspinous and your infraspinous. So above the spine and below the spine. The supraspinous fossa is going to be the origin site for the supraspinatus muscle, which is one of your rotator cuff muscles. Your infraspinous is going to be an attachment site for your infraspinatus muscle, also a rotator cuff muscle. When you're looking at the anterior view, you'll see another distinct fossa. This is referred to as the subscapular fossa. And your subscapularis muscle is going to originate here, another rotator cuff muscle. 